one of the things that I've seen you talk about on your Instagram page is 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 squatting. Uh, it, it's it's obviously there's, there's so many benefits around that particular movement, and it's one of the things. This is a bit of a selfish question, really, but for for. 15 or 20 years, I, I, I love squatting. It's always been really important, but I kind of always did the same thing. I started about 60 kilos, went up to about 140, came down. And as I've got older, I, you know, I'm paying for that in terms of my back. So as it's such a great exercise, and, and I suppose it's one that people probably need to incorporate into their training program, is there a, um, is there a safe way that you can make sure that as you age and you're probably not uh, moving as well and then you're loading a lot of weight and you're creating these injuries is there a real safe way that you can actually get into squatting and it, and even as you do it over time that you you know some things that you could probably start to make sure everything's working in the same way so you don't end up creating issues and injuries as you get older yeah this this question came full circle and it became real life last year where uh, my ppsc staff uh for my birthday they sent me a toilet and it went right to my front door and they dropped off a toilet on my porch. And I was thinking, what in the heck? And it was a comment that I made uh, on Instagram. Um, I was being facetious with it, but it was actually real. And the big thing today is like, oh, people shouldn't bilaterally squat. Bilaterally squatting is how you blow out your back and it's bad for your knees and all this stuff. And I simply said, like, if you plan on lowering your ass to the toilet for the rest of your life with autonomy, meaning that nobody's helping you, you better be able to keep a bilateral squat within your program and you better be able to train it mean meaningfully. Does that mean that somebody has to load a barbell on their back, you know, with 200 kilos on it just to man up and get it out of the hole? No. <laughs> It means that we need to have a bilateral stance with both feet on the ground and being able to go through a range of motion that can help us get strong, not only at the lower body, but across the core and the upper body. You know, some of the best ways to re-ingrain a squat pattern is to simplify the process. Uh, we utilize a couple different tools that really help us re-establish the bottom foundational metrics of that movement pattern itself. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of being able to box squat, box squatting appropriately and effectively, but box squatting nonetheless. Being able to use anterior front-sided loads, things like goblet squats and modified front squats, that has been a staple in our programming as well. And then being able to have the capacity to establish a fuller range of motion through free squatting, that's ultimately where we would like to see people get. But it's cool if we don't ever get there with a bar on our back. There are many different ways to train patterns without the dogma of a single loading tool. Usually it's the barbell. It's like, man, if I can't lift with the barbell anymore, like I'm just going to go like sit on the couch, Netflix and chill and eat Cheetos <laughs> instead. But there's always a different way to train the same pattern, same but different. And I think reestablishing that pattern is huge. But the squat, for whatever reason, there's a lot of mixed emotions about it. And I love squatting as much as anyone else, but I also see the benefit of split squatting. I see the benefit of Bulgarian split squats. I see the benefits of lunges, but it's just a different pattern in my mind. The way the neural developmental sequence works, these are two different distinct patterns, single leg, lower body, asymmetrical stance pattern versus a squat pattern. But squatting by no means needs to just be with the barbell. We start people with goblet box squats. We progress them from there and we work to get strong across trying to get a full body recruitment pattern with the squat itself. And that alone, you know, we can get a great training effect with a 50 pound dumbbell held in the goblet position with the right set rep and rest schemes with great execution. It's a matter of how do you utilize the tools that are appropriate for you at that point in time in your life, but also how do you train hard enough to, again, elicit the stimulus as we were talking about before. Right. Two questions then before we wrap up and you run off to the, to catch a, catch a plane. Um, you talk about the butt and, um, why why we want to have a big butt so um it was an interesting thing I, um it certainly caught my attention but um why is a big butt important and what is the best way to build it it makes you sexy <laughs> that's why 
And that's today, you know, that's the last number of years uh, in our fitness industry and really across America. I think America are the pioneers, the big asses. <laughs> and I'm proud of that. But as we have more big asses walking around, uh, we learn more because there's more researchers that are going through focused on glute development, uh, one of which is a good friend of mine. And we look at the hip specifically. Is the intermediary joint the biggest joint in the human body? Okay, cool. We know that. It's halfway between the lower body and the torso and the upper body. But the hip is protected and it is ingrained and intertwined with the mechanics of not only the pelvis, but also the lumbar spine and the spine in general. So we look at the biggest protecting mechanism, in my opinion, on the spine and on the pelvis and the hip structure and that entire complex as the biggest, thickest muscle in the body, which is the glutes. The glutes are the king because the glutes can not only get big, they can not only get strong, they can not only protect the spine and the hips, but they are metabolically very, very pleasing for people because bigger muscles mean stronger muscles. Bigger and stronger muscles mean that they burn more calories and they play a bigger role in systemic health. I could talk about the glutes forever, but the big thing that people get wrong today is that, yes, they want bigger glutes. They want stronger glutes. I'm talking about glutes every week on Instagram, but the ways in which they develop them are not usually right. Um, there's multiple ways to develop any type of uh, muscular region or movement pattern, but there's certain things that just don't work. You know, walking up the Stairmaster with a band around your knees for 45 minutes sideways is not the best way to build gluteal tissue. Um, other things, doing reps of 200 on dumbbell or cable kickbacks, that's not an appropriate way. The glutes are not this like new magical thing that defy the principles of exercise science and physiology. It's just another muscular region that needs to be trained appropriately. And what is appropriate? We look at having like a three-pronged approach to glute training. We look at heavy loading. Um, that can be established with your squatter, uh, your hip hinge patterns, your deadlifts, or it could be established with things like hip thrusts. And then we look at uh, hypertrophy-based loading, which is maybe anywhere from about eight to 15-ish rep ranges hitting close to failure. And this is best suited with having intermediary planes of motion hit, meaning that we get the hip into extension, external rotation, a slight abduction. So multiple synergistic factors of actions of the glutes tend to help hypertrophy a lot. And then finally, um, we do do isolation work. It does look like Instagram booty chick shit, but it does work if you put it into the program in the right time and places. Anywhere from about 15 to 50 reps, this is really along the lines of hip abduction, hip external rotation. And I usually don't have heavy loading with this. We don't lock into machines on this. These are usually band or body weight movements. But what most people are missing is the heavy loading through foundational movement patterns and then the traditional quote unquote bodybuilding or hypertrophy work. You can't just go straight to the metabolic stress work and think that you're going to grow. Most likely you're going to end up with overuse injuries and you're going to end up with a flabbier, flatter butt. And that is not the goal of glute training. <laughs> but we look at uh, my training systems and something that I see when I, when I go to a course and I see our attendees, I'm like, damn, these people have some strong looking posterior chains. And it's true. They got big butts, they got thick hamstrings, and their upper backs are very, very developed. And it's the reason because we establish volumes that are about a three to one ratio posterior to anterior. There's a lot more involved with that statement, but these pain-free performance ratios, it matters. And especially reestablishing the biggest, broadest, heaviest hitting musculature in the human body, you can't go wrong with developing your upper back, your back, your glutes, or your hamstrings. Um, that is going to be what keeps you upright when you're 80 years old. And those are the things that actually in our culture today are the most aesthetically pleasing. Uh, the funniest thing that I heard is bigger butts make you biologically more attractive across all species. I, was like, <laughs> I can get behind that. <laughs> you can get behind that. Like, we, we won't go there. Um, <laughs> <laughs>